Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight for a micro pitch number four, our last micro pitch of the year. I have to start by thanking our host location, York County and the city of Williamsburg and James City County, which make up Greater Williamsburg, and also the cities of Hampton, Newport News and Pocosin. Uh, we have a great event lined up for tonight. Tim, did you wanna chime in here real quick? Yeah, we do have a great event lined up, Gary. Thanks. Uh, so in less than two hours, we will know the final group of pitchers that are going to advance to the championship finale event that's going to take place on November 8th. So to quickly recap, we had our first micro pitch in March, and the winners there were Game On, Advisor Finder, and Infra SGA. Uh, and then in April, we had micro pitch number two, and the winners were Bobo Collective, Keep Up, and Free Life. And then last month, we had micro pitch number three, and the winners were Elliptocraft, Stu Tech, and Vino Visa. Uh, and for tonight, as with the previous micro pitches, we have uh, 10 founders that are going to pitch their business. The top three uh, from tonight will then advance to the championship pitch in November. So what you're watching tonight is the last stop of the year. So Gary, before we get started, what are the rules? Yeah, we have a few requests. One is to please refrain from using the group chat feature to make comments to everyone, especially while someone's pitching. We don't wanna disturb or distract the pitcher. If you wanna use the chat feature to connect with a specific person, Please go direct with that person you want to connect with, preferably not while they're pitching. And then uh, thanks in advance for honoring those requests. So we're eager to get started tonight. As Tim said, we have 10 pitchers. Each pitcher will have three minutes to pitch their business. And then that will be followed by two minutes of Q&A with the judges. And the way Q&A works is that uh, all three judges will ask their questions one after the other. And so pitchers, you want to be sure they have something to capture their questions. And then the pitcher will have two minutes to answer the questions that have been asked. So uh, again, be sure you have something to take notes with. And please don't start to answer any questions until all the judges have provided their questions to you. Tim, speaking of judges, who are the judges tonight? Yeah, we have three returning judges uh, that we've had in the past. I mean, it, that's the uh, risk you take when you do too good of a job. We're going to continue to to ask you back time and time again. First up, we have Carlton Campbell. Uh, he was a former EDA member from the city of Hampton. He is the senior director of engineering at uh, Elevance Health. So, Carlton, welcome back. Thank you so much for uh, for what you do for the entrepreneurial community. Thank you. Glad to be here. And we have Marty Kazabowski. Marty is a returning judge from the Virginia ICAP program and also serves as a mentor for the SBDC, been around in the scene for quite some time. Thanks, Marty, for uh, continuing to give back. Always a pleasure. And uh, same goes with uh, William McFeet, also from the Virginia SBDC uh, and the ICAP program. So as you hear, all of our judges are by design. They've been here, they've done it before, they know what they're looking for, they know what they want to ask. And uh, you're now in the pipeline of the entrepreneurial ecosystem within Hampton Roads. So welcome uh, back, everyone. Thank you, judges, for your time. Uh, the way that tonight's going to work, the first five pitchers are going to pitch, then we'll take a short break. Uh, once uh, we return, the final five pitchers are going to pitch. The judges will then be whisked away into their deliberation room, uh, and during that time, we'll open things up for a question and answer period. Give a little rundown of what to expect uh, on November 8th. Then once they're done, we'll announce uh, the three finalists that are going to uh, make their way uh, to that championship pitch. And as a reminder, pitchers, we know that uh, you're nervous, so just consider this a friendly reminder. When it's your turn to pitch, unmute yourself, share your screen if you have slides that uh, that you're going to share with us. Uh, once your pitch is done, stop sharing your screen. Judges are going to ask their questions. Once that last question is asked, then you can address all three of those questions within two minutes. Then when you're complete, mute your mic and enjoy the rest of the evening. So that said, let's get started. Gary, who's up first? Oh, well, first pitcher is going to be Thomas Hunter. Thomas, are you ready? Yes, sir. Just as a reminder, uh, Tim will start the, the clock, your three minutes when you start speaking. 
And then the Q&A, he'll start the clock when you start answering the questions. So everybody, please welcome Thomas Hunter from Edenic Energy. Cool. So 75% of black and brown people are more likely to live in highly polluted areas, giving these individuals limited access to clean air, healthy buildings, and thriving economic environments. So it's not a coincidence that these buildings contribute to about 38% of the carbon emissions in the U.S. Now, the Department of Energy did an incredible study about buildings, and what they found that there is 122 million outdated buildings in the U.S. They cost building owners $400 billion annually, consume 75% of the U.S. electricity, but unfortunately, one-third of the energy and the cost is wasted every single year. So this means that outdated buildings in disadvantaged communities create energy poverty and building owners struggle economically. These building owners need a fundamentally different approach. That approach is Edenic Energy. We make buildings talk to their owners and their operators. So think of Google Home, but for commercial buildings and spaces. We connect our software and our hardware solution to the building so we can identify, design, and manage energy and operational improvements from any digital screen in the world. Now, this is how it works. The building owner types in their address, their building type, and their role. And then immediately, we unlock value by collecting and organizing all of their building information into one centralized place. Next, we're able to process that information to execute energy and operational models for actionable steps the business owner can take. So what this does, this creates intelligent decision making during the life cycle of the asset and empowers the users with new levels of visibility and actionable information that directly impacts the environment and their bottom line. Now, my name is Thomas Hunter. I'm a three-time founder. I have accreditation in leadership in energy and environmental design, and I'm completing my electrical engineering degree at DeVry University. So I know how to penetrate huge markets like the smart building market, but we look at our market as in how many outdated buildings are there. There's 122 million, 5 million are commercial buildings, which is our serviceable market, and we're launching in Portsmouth with 4,000 commercial buildings at our disposal. Now, some key uh, things in our journey that happened, uh, so many things have happened, but one of the biggest accomplishments, of course, is us getting about 12 pilots under our belt in Portsmouth, Virginia, and Norfolk, and also DC, but also we are an Impel Innovator, which is a DOE-backed program implemented by Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. So, Today, we actually ask, you know, to be one of the winners, of course, in this pitch competition, um, but also we want any introductions to building owners, we want any introductions also to anybody that is able to invest into our seed round. So we know that it is environmental inclusion that will unlock the energy transition for the well being for all. So guys, join us and together we can build paradise. Thank you. And that's time. Stop sharing. Did I stop sharing? Yes, yeah, I think I stopped sharing. Gary, you are muted. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, thanks, Thomas. We're going to start with Carlton to tonight. Do you have something to write down stuff with, Thomas? Questions. There you go. Go ahead, Carlton. Hi, Thomas. Uh, a good presentation. I actually missed a little bit of the beginning, but that was my fault. It was hidden behind another screen, but I, I heard everything you had to say. Um, what I'm interested in is to know a little bit more about your revenue model. Um, uh, how do you plan to price uh, these companies these, or these building owners um, access to your IoT devices and the data uh, that you would pro uh, be providing them to I, I guess, let them know what type of, of um, <clears throat> changes they would need to make in their business or in their buildings, rather. And next, Marty. Yeah, I'll, I'll let William ask the question about traction and such. But uh, what I want to hear about, Tom, it's good to see you, by the way. Good presentation. Um, is uh, intellectual property. What, what do you own in this whole process? Do you own the data? Do you have something that's protectable so other folks can't do what you do? And then William. Okay, hi, very nice presentation, thanks. Uh, uh, actually, I'm gonna pass on the traction question. But... 
Uh, I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit, have you spoken to, you know, done any customer discovery here? Have you spoken to uh, any of the owners or, uh, and also I just, I am making an assumption that your customer segment was the owners of the building, not people ten tenanting in different parts of the building or different businesses. So maybe just some clarification on that too, please. Okay, so Tim will give you two minutes when you start answering. Awesome. So first question, we use a uh, revenue model called energy as a service. So what that simply means is whatever we save the building owner, we get a percentage of that. And that's our main revenue model. Um, we do have a freemium model where building owners can access uh, their data in an organized way. We also use um, subscription model in our front end. But the main one that we're really focused on is energy as a service. Uh, I give you a dollar, I save you a dollar, at least give me 30 cents back. That's basically what, what it means. Um, second question, we're currently going through the IP process. It's funny, I just got an email from my lawyer a couple of days ago about some of the things that we um, petitioned a year and a half ago. Um, of course, that's a long process, but we do own the data that the IoT devices do collect. There are some data privacy things that we implemented with the building owner. So it's that shared concept right there. And for number three, we have 12 pilot projects going on, um, about 28 projects that are um, in the back end because we're just my bandwidth isn't that long, um, but also we're a part of many other different accelerators. Um, we got some grant funding from the Department of Energy. We did over 200 customer discovery um, meetings and, and still talking to building owners right now as we speak. So um, I think the main thing that we're doing right now is focusing on hiring and focusing on growing to the next level where we can take on more building owners in our area. Hopefully I answered your guys' questions. Thank you. Nice one. Hey, thanks, Thomas. Thank you, guys. Um, Seiko, are you ready? I am ready. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's just give the judges a, let me get a thumbs up from them. I got Carlton's good. I can't Is see. Is it being shared properly? And Marty, are you good? Okay. William's still looking, it looks like. I, I was on the wrong tab, sorry. Um, That's okay. Perfect. Just let me know when you're done. I'm done. Okay. Okay, um, Seiko, you can share your screen again. Everybody, please welcome Seiko Warner from Hampton Roads Green Book. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> let me start sharing the screen again. All right. Hopefully everything is being shared properly. Yep, we can see everything. You're on. Beautiful. All right, so I'm Seiko Varner with the Hampton Roads Green Book. Our product, our service is a directory. Now, whoa. All right, in the Black community, money circulates once. In the Latino community, six times. Asian community, nine times. And in the white community, the money circulates for an infinite, infinite amount of time. And we found out that communities that self-resource have lower amounts of statistics that we don't want. So we decided to do something so we can get rid of some of those issues. Why is it not working? Communities that self-resource, as I say, have lower rates of poverty, preventable diseases, teen parenthood, imprisonment, crime, and violence. So our solution is addressing problems that have plagued the communities since the late 1960s, the early 1970s. And so our product, our service is the Hampton Rose Green Book, which is a app and a website that is a directory of black and minority owned businesses, organizations, and professionals. So we can help make sure that the money resources and circulates a lot better. We can make sure that some of the ills that we're addressing can be addressed with a little more fervor. We can put a lot more resources behind the ills that we're trying to address. And that's what our website, our app does. So we have a tiered process for people coming in. Everyone can come in free through our community service wing. And then our sustainability and growth strategy allows for tiered payments for larger scale advertising and larger amounts of exposure within the platform. This is the strategy we'll use to make sure that we can sustain this
project. Now, we have a lot of different categories, even though it highlights Black and minority businesses, we have a lot of other categories that people can search within, and we accept all. So supporting this initiative will help you support over a thousand businesses, organizations, and professionals at one time. So what are we looking for? We're looking for additional Black veteran women and Latinx businesses, professionals, and organizations to take one of the free listings and place it into the platform. We're also looking for a Powered by Sponsor. And that's coming in at $3,000. And that helps us with the infrastructure and make sure that we can do some of the marketing and promotional things to ensure that our money circulates a lot longer and a lot stronger. I'm really happy to say that yesterday, the app showed up in the Google Play and the I, Apple, you know, the, I don't, I'm a team Android, but the Apple Store as well. So you can find us online at hrgreenbook.com and you can find us on your Apple and your Android device. Circulation is key. You know, think about it. If your breathing doesn't circulate well, you have health problems. If your blood doesn't circulate well, you and have health problems. Gone. Okay, thank you. Uh, you got something to take some questions, some notes on your questions? Ready to go. Okay, we're gonna start with Marty mm -hmm. this time. Right, thanks, uh, nicely done. Um, the question I sort of want to ask, which I'm not going to ask, is why doesn't this already exist and why doesn't Google do this? But what I am going to ask is how do you scale this to other regions beyond Hampton Roads? How intense, how difficult, how much money does it take to, to do the next city, the next city, the next city? Okay. And we go to William next. Yeah, hi. Uh, what I'd like to ask is a real about your value proposition and what kind of quantification you're going to put on that, as in what kind of percentage increase in business are you going to be able to claim to uh, encourage people to sign up for you? Okay. And, and Carlton. And my questions, uh, great presentation uh, too, by the way, Seiko. My questions are centered around the subscriber based, uh, like how many subscribers do you currently have? What's the typical subscription level that they're coming in at? And how do you plan to market um, the website? Okay, well, I'll, is that all the questions? Yeah, and then Tim will start the clock on when you start answering. Okay, great. I, I'm going to start from the last question and go backwards. Uh, we currently have 1,700 listings in the platform. And we started the platform with some preloaded information. We go live this Sunday. So to be honest with you, a lot of the questions, I mean, part of your question, I can't answer until after we go live. Uh, we do have 20 subscribers right now, but we go live on Sunday and that's when we start going after subscribers. Uh, in terms of you know, the value proposition, how we can determine that we're really providing value to the community with this resource, we're working with an analytics, analytics company that's going to be helping us find ways to track the movement of the resources to make sure that we are impacting and improving the community the way that we say that we are. Uh, and how do we scale to other areas? We're actually not concerned with other areas at this point. We're really focused on Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads is gonna be our test product. And if we can demonstrate that we're able to really change the economics in Hampton Roads. There are a lot of other platforms similar in other areas, not in Hampton Roads, but in New York, in Atlanta, in California. So we're just gonna show that we have the best strategies and then the other groups can follow our strategies and hopefully improve their communities as well. But we're really firmly focused on our beloved 757. All right. Hopefully questions. Okay, so we'll just give the judges a, a few seconds here to update their sheets. And um, Sonelli, are you ready? Okay, don't share your screen yet. Let me just make sure I get the okay from the judges. Marty's good. Carlton's good. Sounds William's good. good. You can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. As soon as you share that, I will introduce you. Okay, everybody, please welcome Sonelli Lasana from Adult Tumbling. Hi, everybody. 
wake up, get ready, grab your coffee, head to work. Get comfy at your desk, sit through a string of meetings, head home, dinner, sleep, and repeat. This is the typical day of the average adult in America. Doesn't sound like a lot of room for play or fun, does it? Recent studies show the average adult experiences 131 days of boredom a year. 73% of adults still miss aspects of their childhood, such as time with friends and less, and less responsibilities. This lack of fun and play can lead to feelings of depression and loneliness. I mean, let's face it, adulting can get old sometimes. That's where Adult Tumbling 757 comes into play. We help working adults discover a new approach to life through fitness and play. We do this by offering our community fitness, friends, and fun. Our product offerings include pop-up style tumbling classes in which we rent at various cheerleading and gymnastics facilities in the area to host, as well as branded merchandise, such as loungewear, activewear, home egg, and tumbling merchandise. Our customers typically range from the ages of 25 through 45 and consist of former athletes, fitness enthusiasts, and fun lovers who are always looking for something new to try. Most of our customers are individuals who have never tumbled before and have always wanted to, but either couldn't afford to do so as a kid or lived in an area where tumbling was not an option for them. According to the IBIS World Report, the fitness industry generated $30.8 billion in 2022. The rising cost of healthcare and the effects of COVID-19 continue to help drive growth in this industry. To date, Adult Tumbling 757 has been very successful in this industry, hosting over 200 classes, selling over 900 class tickets, with 86% of class tickets selling out in the first 24 hours of ticket sales. We use strategic partners, an email list, social media platforms such as Instagram and TikTok, and our network from accelerators and incubators to market our product. So what's next for Adult Tumbling 757? We want to host our first class outside of the Hampton Roads area in which we've had inquiry from individuals in areas such as DC, New York, and North Carolina to come and host a class in their city. We also want to host a class tour where we will travel from uh, different states in the US to host our classes and continue time. to spread our community. All right. Okay, thank you. You have something to take some notes? Some judge questions? Yes, I'm good to go. Okay, we're starting with William this time. Hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, some nice visuals there. Um, <clears throat> I was. My question is again around the customers. Really, uh, you mentioned that you're looking your customer group would be ones who have never tumbled or wanted to tumble, but wanted to tumble. I'm wondering how you target those specifically. And uh, related to that, do you have any repeat customers, or how many repeat customers have you had already? And Carl, next. Yeah, great uh, presentation, uh, Snelly. Uh, my question is centered around what is your average class size and ticket price? Mm -hmm. And is there any variety in what you offer as far as tumbling experiences to your, um, to your customers? Mm -hmm. And then Marty. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question to Carlton about the revenue model. But <clears throat> what I really want to understand is, uh, Again, how does this scale? I mean, what, what does this company look like in five years? Is this the next pickleball? Okay, so Tim has, uh, we'll give you two minutes on the clock when you start answering their questions. Okay. Am I good to go now? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So our average class size ranges from eight to 10 participants. We have a intimate class setting. This ensures that the class is safe. That way the instructor is able to really have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with individuals. 
Um, our class prices, we are about to raise prices beginning of 2024. Class tickets will now be $40 a class ticket. And we also offer classes in different skill levels. So beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And we also offer a fitness class that just helps you build strength for tumbling. So this helps us offer a range of variety. And this is also how we target our newbies. So with that beginner class, it really helps us target to people who have never tumbled before. Um, we usually use Instagram and Facebook ads, which has been very successful for, for us with selling out our class tickets. Um, as far as repeats, we have tumblers who have been tumbling with us for three years. They come to class every single month and have um, continuously done so. And how does this scale and what does this look like in the next five years? Um, we, we will scale this by continuing to uh, raise prices as well and host in many, uh, in more areas, hire more coaches to be host hosting in more areas as well as really focus on our merchandise and our branding um, to continue to build our community. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Give the judges a few minutes or a few seconds to update their sheets. Uh, next up is Marwan. Don't share your screen yet. Um, just wait till I get the thumbs up. William's good. Kurt, okay, everybody's good. All right, you can share your screen now, Marwan, and I'll introduce you. All right. Okay, please welcome Marwan Sadok from Greenlight Auto Auctions. Thank you. All right, so millions of Americans trade in or sell their cars to dealers every year. And the same problems keeps on happening. As you can see here from the first review is from CarMax, uh, where uh, a customer went to trade in their car. It's a waste of my time for an appraisal. 11,000 for the car where he was able to sell it to another dealer for 19,800. The second one is from Carvana where they, they got an offer for 1,100 and they were selling, uh, they were able to sell the car to another dealer for 3,100, uh, prepared to be ripped off. Uh, the problem in trading a car is from the pri private owner perspective, there is a lack of trust between the buyer and the dealer you go and take the car to. Limited outlets and who is gonna give you the most for the car. Uh, and independent dealers who are on the other end of, uh, of, of uh, buy, buying the car at the end, uh, there is no car history on the car. And also they, they said they buy the car as is. Uh, what is the problem? So when you go and you, you, uh, you buy a car as an independent dealer, the cost looks like this. There is the trade-in price. That's the, the, the trade-in price for the, the first seller. And there is the planned repairs for issues you can see and planned repairs for uh, issues that you can't see or hidden and wholesale wholesaler profits, which is the midman and the auction fees. By bypassing the midman, uh, pro uh, providing 360 inspection and the multi bidders is gonna look, look more like this, where more money gonna go toward the, the private seller's pocket and the planned repairs is gonna increase and green light fee. Uh, this is how our app will work. Uh, as you can see as a seller, you'll be able to log in and easily uh, uh, post your car um, just by providing the VIN. Uh, the pre-auction inspection is uh, scheduled. An inspector will come to your home, inspect the cars, look at all the issues, um, uh, report every single detail and issue on the car, and the auction will start after that. Dealers will start getting a notification that the car is, uh, is on the platform and the bidding will start. Once the auction is over, uh, the seller, uh, the buyer will get the, the car and the seller will get the check for, uh, for, for the car they have sold. Um, the benefits is connecting private owners with dealers who are willing to pay the most for their cars. Fast transaction, auction only takes 30 minutes and, you can, and the car is sold. Uh, and on every car, there's condition report and uh, every issue on the car. And from the dealer perspective, also there is confidence on, on having a transparent transaction and confidence to pay more for each car. Our business model will consist of marketplace model, which is a fee applied to the buyer, transport fee uh, as a, if if some if some uh, if the car is too far, advertisements for for issues, and we will provide the extended warranties for the buyers if they 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 want to they want to pay for that. 
Uh, our team consists of three ODU graduates, uh, myself, the CEO, uh, Priyank Patel, CTO, and uh, Anatoly Prochok, who is the CEO, are also fine. engineers. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and share your screen. And you have something to capture some questions from the judges? Okay, right. we're ready. We're gonna start this time with Carlton. Yeah, a good presentation. Very interesting um, business there. I'm, I'm curious about how you marketing your service and who pays for the inspection and when. <laughs> Yeah, Marty. Yeah, sort of similar. I'm curious about your revenue model. How, how do you make money in this whole process, given that you have to get a lot of folks out to the cars to do the inspections? How do you make money on this? Mm -hmm. And William. It seems to me, oh, sorry, nice presentation as well, by the way. Um, it seems to me as a very competitive area you're trying to break into, and I'm not wholly clear on what your unique aspect is that's going to be significantly better than competition. Okay, so you have two minutes as soon as you start speaking, and uh, Tim will let you know when two minutes is up. All right. So the the, the how how we're gonna market market it. That's that's the main problem that we have. To be honest with you, right now, as uh, we've been uh, working with uh, on uh, Facebook and uh, doing some uh, advertisements on uh, uh, with the with the, the other dealers as well as mechanics, basically, because when somebody goes to fix the car, usually they have issues with the car. That's why they want to get rid of it. So we're trying to work see which one works. But we've been seeing some good. Uh, results as far as Facebook because more most people are there to either sell their car or trying to buy another car on the Facebook marketplace as far as the revenue model so we have uh, we uh, an average of three hundred dollars uh, per car is uh, paid for by the the buyer uh, it's like a buying fee and the dealers are, are used to paying that premium and any auction where they go uh, as well as we have transport fee for uh, if you want us to take care of your transportation as well as uh, warranty uh, uh how uh, the other part is uh is competitive yes but we are the only uh, the only one right now that uh, that we don't just take offers uh we actually uh, provide an auction and um as dealer myself i can tell you for for uh, when i go to an auction i usually pay more than when somebody brings me a car and i'm gonna give them uh, an offer for their car just because I'm, tr I'm it's just the mindset is different uh, when somebody brings me a car I'm trying to pay the least possible for the car when I go to the auction I'm trying to put the maximum that I'm going to pay uh, with still making money uh, so it's it's just different uh, mindsets so that's that's and that's all that money goes towards the private uh, owners at the end uh, all right I still have the time uh, uh, so the, the the other part of the, the the how we make money is also targeted at, uh, advertisement. So if somebody uh, provides a car that needs an alternator, we can advertise for an alternator for that specific car from eBay, and we'll be able to increase our uh, our monetary uh, basically for, uh, from from that perspective as well as what I talked about before. That's time. The transport. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll uh, wait a few seconds here for the judges to give me the thumbs up. Marty's good. Carlton's good. William's good. And TK, are you ready? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Uh, let me just okay. share my screen or let me know once you shared my screen. Yeah, you can, can you share me? it and then I'll introduce you. Yep. All right, can you see it? Uh, yep, you're good. Okay, everybody, please welcome TK Kadadi from Culture. Let me know. Uh, yeah, to start. I just introduced you. Go ahead. Yep, All I'll right. start when you start. All right. Good evening, uh, everybody on the on the call. So welcome to Culture. Uh, so here, I'm going to talk about three challenges. So uh, the First one is when it comes to traveling here in the US, we're known for really traveling uh, at our local level. But when it comes to traveling internationally, uh, especially like a $2 trillion industry, only one out of five Americans travel. 
with half of our population holding uh, passports. So, and then also when it comes to heritage preservation, we are the most diverse country in the world with 13.6% of immigrants and one out of three born, uh, you know, ch children or babies here in the US are either from uh, international or immigrant parents or was born overseas. And yet we, after the third generation, our heritage basically is lost. Lastly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sustainability and transportation. Uh, number one, 40% increase in cost of travel, especially air travel. Also transportation represents one of the uh, number one factors negatively impacting uh, the environment. And last but not least for people who travel knows that going through the, the TSA and airports is a big hassle. So how are we gonna solve this? Well, the solution is called Tour. It's an online marketplace that allows individuals to experience cultures from around the world at a local level. So I want you guys to think global, but travel local. So we're gonna create a decentralized world where it's, there are a lot of layers where within your neighborhood, you can travel in so many places in a fracture of the, the money, also at a, a less time. Well, that, that will create a more, like a more connected uh, you know, community, more educated about other uh, uh, cultures, but more importantly, it's gonna unveil a new on, a layer of entrepreneurs. How does that work? Well, I'll meet the ambassadors. So my family is an example, uh, is uh, uh, basically a good example about that. We're originally from Morocco. My wife is first generation American, uh, Moroccan American, and then my son was born here. So when you come to our house, basically you feel like you stepped in into Morocco. When that picture you see there, you don't know whether you're in Morocco or we're in Newport News, Virginia. And we can basically share with you our music, architecture, basic information about Morocco, fashion, art, and uh, you know uh, the list goes on and on. And then when it comes to the guests, the guests will come and book uh, the experience to our platform and basically uh, will well fit their needs, budget and schedule. They can basically categorize that based on the filter model that we have on our website. Currently, we have our MVP, culture.io is already live in the test mode. And our goal is to have a soft launch this month, go through a marketing campaign over the next couple of months, go live within Hampton Roads first, then expand to Virginia, and then the US with an explosion happening in, during the World Cup. 2026 with the 42, 48 countries uh, being participating in that. Me, the founder, my name is Tofik Hadadi. I'm a true African-American, basically born in Morocco, has spent half of my life there. I'm a recovered engineer uh, with a project management experience, and now I'm handling sales for uh, my company. I speak four languages. Ebonics is not one of them. I'm interested in people and cultures, and I was privileged to travel uh, over 38 or 39 states and four cont continents, and I would love to share that with basically that time, uh, people GK. out there. All right. Okay, thank you. If you go ahead and unshare your screen and uh, have something to capture some questions from the judges. Yep. Okay, and we're gonna start this time with Marty. Yeah, so just walk me through the revenue model. How do you make money on this? And then William. Uh, hi, a very interesting concept, although, yeah, I mean, travel and actually being places is something special. Uh, so I was wondering again about customer discovery here. What have you done by way of customer discovery and uh, finding out people's interest in this? And then Carlton. Yeah, I, rem I remember you, TK, from last year yeah. with a different business model that you had, I think dealing with uh, some software and, and uh, relating to app, uh, education, somehow tying to that. But um, this is very interesting. And what I'm interested in is your ambassador recruiting. Uh, how are you getting ambassadors or people from these different cultures to be able to um, uh, share their experiences with you know, those that are interested? And how do you plan to market that experience or those experiences? OK, so you have two minutes to start uh, answering questions. Tim will give you two minutes when you start. All right, give me one second. and. Uh... Can I go ahead and share my screen again? Yep. yep. All right. Uh, so yeah, so first question, very straightforward uh, as far as business model. So our goal is to look into uh, the host, basically, that's where we get with our money, where there are the sometimers, the part-timers, and the full-time ambassadors. Uh, it starts with 15%, uh, unlimited amount of events, but if you want to have like a, a less percent or less fee, we can go to a subscription-based model with $100 a month, and then 10% fee versus 15, up to 20 events, and then from there we go to basically a full-blown ambassador, $500 a month, uh, basically with 5% uh, fee, and then unlimited. 
uh, customer discovery. I mean, I've been just talking to like I have a big circle for international people, and everybody like that I mentioned this uh, you know business platform. They're like just let me know when it goes live, and then we'll be there. So uh, I have yet to meet somebody who would tell me this is not a good idea. As far as basically our uh, uh, marketing, we're gonna go through basically Instagram and all the word of mouth things like that. And then uh, as far as um, like uh, uh, who would be like the perfect ambassador, just picture with me like that uh, individual that spent that came, let's say from Morocco, from Brazil, or from you know Mexico, Spain, whatever the country name it, spent here about 40 years, retired, and now basically they they think about like transferring that uh, knowledge and that uh, culture to the next generation. They're not ready. I mean, the best way to go about it is to open up a restaurant, but you don't have an energy when you're sick. You want to do it at your own time. So opening up a house, kind of like a, a Airbnb model, so to say, where you open like a section of your house uh, to experience your culture, uh, or you can look at it as a, a, a booking basically platform. So the goal is to kind of like word of mouth, uh, do uh, social media marketing through uh, Instagram and start it as a local level. Uh, for example, uh, in our neighborhood, we, we have a Facebook page where I can start there and then it will grow from there. That is time. Okay. You can unshare your screen. Okay. Um, Judge will give you a few seconds to update your sheet. Okay, Marty's good, William's good. And so I'm um, waiting for Carlton here, but we're gonna take a five minute break. Thanks, I got Carlton, thumbs up. We'll take a five minute break. So I have 6.46 right now. So we'll come back at uh, 6.51 and we'll start up with Tamisha Henry when we get back. Are you good, Tamisha? Okay. See you in five minutes. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Getting ready to get started here. We have William is back. Tamisha, you're ready. Marty's back. Carlton's back. So we'll get started. Uh, Tamisha, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Thank hey everybody. You. Please welcome Tamisha Henry from Collaboration Software. What? You're good. Yeah, you're good. Good, good to go. Okay. <laughs> Meet Tiffany, who is a 24-year-old high school graduate who has been diagnosed with being on the autism spectrum. She is employable, but in order for her to be integrated into the workforce, Tiffany needs assistance with multiple government agencies. The problem with Tiffany is these agencies do not work together. Tiffany can spend hours each month attempting to collaborate with multiple agencies to achieve one goal. For too many is a bridge far too wide. The problem is there are duplicate services, stovepiped operations, and no collaboration across agencies. I know this hardship way too well because my daughter is on the autism spectrum. My name is Tamisha Henry, co-founder of Good Steward Business and Benefits Consulting, LLC. I am developing the solution that will help people like Tiffany become financially independent and contribute to society versus relying on it. I am proud to present to you Collab Set Go. Collab Set Go is a one-stop shop. It's a web-based software that connects different government agencies that work with disabled populations in order to streamline communication and processes on a single dashboard. This is our MVP that is in current development. Collapse at Go simplifies processes, increases collaboration, assists with establishing comprehensive goals for each client to help them reach employment and close gaps in services. As a social worker with over 20 years of experience, my expert team and I have developed the solution that over 200 million people with disabilities in America need. 
I have partnered with Regent University to complete a comprehensive study to, ver to further develop best practices for Collapse at Go to increase government efficiency and multi-agency collaboration. Hampton Social Services, Virginia Department of Rehab, Versability, and Eggleston are also just a few of the organizations that are committed to this research project. Here's how big the problem is. The government is spending over $3 trillion a year in the human services field. And of that, there's over $150 billion of waste in this field. Our pricing for Collab will include a tiered process with an enterprise option for larger organizations, tiers for companies, and a monthly subscription to individual users. We are working with Rector and Incubator and ICAP to further divine, to find processes. My name is Tamisha Henry, and we are seeking support and seed money to support further development for Collab Set Go. And that's time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tamisha. Do you have some, if you want to unshare your screen? <coughs> do you have something to capture the questions the judges are going to ask? I do. Thank you. Okay. Yep. So we're going to start with William. Oh, <clears throat> hi, Tamisha. Um, nice Hello. presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Good to hear that you're working with ICAP as well. Um, my <laughs> question for you really is, I, I was just a little bit unclear about who precisely was the customer here. Are you? Is it the agencies or the individual? Or is it some combination of both that is your actual customer? And then we're going to go to Carlton. Yeah, mine kind of ties into uh, Williams, and thanks for the presentation too. It was uh, very informative. It is the intent of the site, and this is where I'm a little bit confused, to provide a checklist for clients who uh, utilize your services? Is it provide them the opportunity to um, fill out one application and it goes to all these other agencies? I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to understand, is it just a site that provides access to these resources, or does it simplify the process of applying to the services that are offered by these resources. Yeah. And Mark. Uh, a related question to, to Carlton's, uh, this is becoming a thing. I've seen easily six or seven of these similar sort of, uh, sort of nexus points for services delivery. What differentiates you from the competition? Okay, and uh, take okay. just two minutes when you start to answer and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will begin with answering William's question uh, in regards to the purpose of Collapse at Go. Uh, there are multiple purposes. It could be for referrals. It could be to find information from an organization. It could be for a social work, uh, social services agency, and a rehab agency to define goals and steps in order to help the person to become employed, to gain housing, and so forth. So it's more of a collaborative piece. A lot of times, each agency doesn't know what the other agency is doing. So it provides duplicate service and duplicate cost and more time. So this allows all of the agencies that are working with individuals and one individual can have up to on average six to eight government agencies and companies working with one individual and they have different goals and not work together. So in regards to uh, that somewhat answers um, Colter's uh, question as well in regards to the purpose. Um, a, the, a person can refer a client is able to get on somewhat like a medical portal. At one point, you will have to contact different doctor's offices in order to find information. But now, if the, all the doctors are under one practice, you go into a one-stop shop, you can chat with them, ask questions, receive your resources, um, and data. And so that will be for the disabled individual, the access that they have to all of the agencies and workers that are assisting them with their goals. And then lastly, with com uh, competition, there are different uh, technology, but this should be one of the primary ones that allow multi-agency collaboration, not just one agency using technology. That's time. Okay, thanks so much for your answers. I'll give the judges a few minutes, a few seconds to uh, update their sheets. Marty's good. 
Carlton's good. And uh, next is going to be Tina. Tina, are you ready? Yes, I am ready. Yeah, just waiting on William, and, and we'll be ready to roll. You good to go, William? OK, great. If you want to go ahead and share your screen, Tina, that'd be great. Everybody, please welcome Tina Mikula from Melodyville. All right. The forgotten birthday. Daryl wakes up, shuts off his alarm on his phone, glances at the date, and gasps because today is his wife's birthday and he's completely forgotten it. So the problem is he has no time and he needs something. He needs a gift. The solution, though, is Songgram, a customizable musical online card. So Daryl would go download the app to his phone. On his home screen, he would pick birthday. The next thing he would do would to be pick a genre of music that he wants. Then he gets to type in a couple of descriptors. He's thinking Monica's blue eyes. It's her 25th birthday. Finally, he reviews the song and hits send. And then at that point, Monica will be able to hear her song, which will sound like With your big blue eyes, you look so fine. Let's drink a toast to 25. All right. So let's take a look. There is nothing currently in the marketplace. Songgram is completely new in this arena because it's the only one that checks all the boxes of customization, customized visual images, customized musical message, a free and premium version, and customized song. Hi, my name is Tina McCula, and for the past 25 years, I've been working with nonprofits and educational institutions to create songs for them that educate, heal, and inspire. And the next step now is to bring Songgram to the marketplace where everybody can enjoy it. So if you take a look at the online greeting card space, you see there's plenty of money to be made and it's only growing by 15%. But our total addressable market would be to have to capture in the, after the first year of post-launch, 15,000 customers. So our target market is millennials and Generation Z because they're the top purchasers of online music and greeting cards. So here's a little bit of what the timeline might look like in, from zero to 12 months. We'll develop, test the app, finally launch it, then go with marketing on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and again, one year post launch, we're looking to capture 15,000 users. The required capital for this venture is $100,000. And it breaks down with the app launch, maintenance, marketing, musical visual template development, and patents and copyrights. So we're looking for partners, investors, tech experts, music creators, and visual artists. So thank you so much for your time and I will try to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. You wanna go ahead and unshare your screen and then we'll start the questioning. If you have uh, something to capture the questions for them from the judges. Yes. You ready? Okay, we're gonna start with Carlton this time. Hey Tina, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, interesting concept. Um, and I think you addressed one of my questions, but I'm curious about how much do you plan to charge per song? And you listed a number of partnerships that I think you've worked with in the past or, or organizations. If you can just elaborate a little bit more as to what you did or what type of service you offered to those organizations uh, to help give me a broader understanding of the services that you provide. And we'll go to Marty. Yeah, Tia, nicely done. <clears throat> As you know, we, I've seen this before a little bit. <clears throat> um, so many questions. <laughs> um, but I'll keep it simple. Uh, who owns the song? And then William. Uh, okay. Uh, again, Marty took my question, as always. <laughs> Uh, but nice presentation and and some yeah some nice numbers. I, I guess I was just also wanting to know a bit more about the, the how you're gonna how you, 
the investors are going to make some money from this. I'm, um, I'm sorry, Tina, it's just a, that's a question that was top of my mind, very similar to, to Carlton. Okay. So Tim will give you two minutes when you start answering and floor is yours. Okay, I'll start with Carlton's question, um, which was, how am I going to charge for this? So the user, the customer, there is a free and a premium version and the customer can buy one musical card or they can have the subscription model, which would be five, five ninety nine, dollars say six bucks, 72 bucks if they sign up for the year, six ninety nine dollars if they wanna just buy one card. Um, what I did with organizations previously for WHRO, I created music that they took for their health beat initiative and um, they developed animations that were on PBS Kids. So that's one thing I did with them for LifeNet. I created a song for their families based on the donor families and um, created an original song for them. So that's just a couple of examples. I went into the schools and worked with the kids to song write so they'd remember their SOLs. Um, who owns the song? I'll go to Marty's question. So basically we're gonna be copywriting our material. So um, the, the song will change a little bit from user to user, but not much and less than 15%. So the copyright would still belong to Songgram. As far as how to make money, again, um, I think I already kind of answered that, which was yeah. that there's gonna be um, you know, a, a free version and a premium version. And how am I going to make money? Also, this would be looking into the future, sell ads on the apps. Um, eventually, I would like to partner. See, once, once the um, utility patent is in place, I would like to approach some of the online greeting card markets and see if they want to upgrade and maybe license the technology to them. Thank you. Now it's time. Okay, thanks, Tina. Thank you. And we'll wait for the judges and uh, Jeremy and Araj, uh, you're next. You guys ready? All right. Okay. So don't don't share anything yet. Let me just wait for the judges. Oh. Can't see them. Sorry about share. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marty's good. They're all good. Okay. You can share your screen. All right. Are you all able to see that in presenter mode? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. All right, I'll get started. I'll announce you here. So please welcome Jeremy Swack and Araj Vij from Forentify. Thank you. Take a look at these photos of Donald Trump, Post Francis, and an explosion near a government building. As realistic as they seem, they're actually 100% AI generated. With the public release of software like Dolly, Midjourney, and Stable Diffusion, it's easier than ever to produce and share realistic images that promote misleading narratives. In fact, Experts in AI predict that as much as 90% of online content may be synthetically generated by 2026. That's a big problem for social media platforms who for years have been under pressure to crack down on misleading online content. In fact, companies like Meta and Google have faced boycotts by advertisers and users and even subpoenas by Congress as a result. These companies have spent hundreds of millions of dollars towards fact-checking content on their platforms to avoid the punitive measures. That's why we're creating Forentify, an all-in-one manipulated media detector. We're leveraging cutting edge computer vision research to build a platform with the most powerful detection algorithms available on the market. To ensure our platform can de detect a wide array of different types of digital manipulations, we're utilizing over two terabytes of training data to train eight proprietary machine learning models. And we're not stopping at detection. To build trust with users, our models have built-in methods that explain frame by frame how a model came to its conclusion. That's what sets us apart from our competitors. Here's a snapshot of what our platform will look like. Users will be able to upload their own content to the platform to generate specific digital forensics reports. These reports will be savable and exportable so that they can re be revisited for future analysis. We've won two grants from Microsoft's Democracy Forward team to support our efforts at Forentify. We're continuing to train and fine tune our first three computer vision models, and we're on track to have a fully functional MVP by the end of this year. We believe that Frentify has immediate market potential through multiple revenue streams, especially ahead of the 2024 election. A subscription to Frentify will give users access to both our API and our web platform. 
Through our API, customers will be able to integrate Friendsify into their platform to automatically gauge the authenticity of user uploaded content. This will be especially helpful for social media companies. Imagine Facebook being able to auto flag images that appear to be fake instead of relying on analysts to manually cull through thousands of posts each day. Through our web platform, customers will be able to generate fine-grained insights with our digital forensics reports. This will be particularly useful for non-technical customers like analysts working in defense and intelligence who monitor digital phenomena. We're looking for strategic partnerships with digital media platforms to beta test our product to ensure it aligns with the needs of our digital landscape. For the last three years, we've been leading Disinfo Lab, the country's first undergraduate-led mis- and disinformation think tank. Now, we're leveraging our technical backgrounds towards building solutions to mis- and disinformation. At Forentify, we're building digital forensics for the age of AI. Thank you. Now it's time. Hey, thank you. Um, OK, ready to capture some judge questions? Yes. OK, good. Uh, this time, we're going to start with Marty. Um, very cool stuff. Uh, love what you do and uh, really <laughs> interested to see this stuff happening here in Hampton Roads. Uh, obviously, all these guys, Googles and such, have armies of guys doing similar stuff. And I won't even mention Fort Meade. <laughs> Why you? Why you guys? Okay, next, William. Yeah, I, I kind of echo what Marty said, really interesting idea, and I'm sure going to be very important going forward. Uh, so I was just wondering, who are you envisaging as your very first market here? Who are you going to go to first, and why? Yeah, this is um, very intriguing to me because I'm heavy into AI uh, on the side, and so I'm very familiar with Midjourney, Dolly, and a whole host of other uh, AI tools that are out there. And when you talk about being able to detect things, you know, for instance, you can use AI to write stuff and, and there are detectors that can detect whether or not it's AI, but then there are other tools you can use to disguise it so that you can't detect that it's AI. And so it's, uh, I'm curious as to how you're going to overcome that issue. You know, the same issue that they have on the writing side, how are you going to do that on the imaging side? And I know there are more nuances on the imaging side that uh, you can probably refer to, but I'd be interested to know a little bit more about kind of the technology behind that as much as you can share. You guys have two sorry, minutes. As soon as you start talking, Tim will give you two minutes and the floor is yours. All right, to start with William's question on our first partner. Um, we're in conversation with two companies. So the first is Accrete AI. They develop AI-powered OSINT software, and they've expressed interest in adding our synthetic AI detection capabilities into their platform. Um, and second is Microsoft's Democracy 4 team has expressed interest in incorporating our software into Bing image search. So that's another avenue that we're exploring. And Jeremy will take the other two questions. Yeah, so to Carlton, answer your question about this kind of race between you know, the, the bad actors and the detectors trying to you know, detect this kind of content. What we're looking to do is take a different approach from some of these other platforms who claim that they can detect things like deep fakes. So rather than focus just on deep fakes dealing with people, we're trying to cre create more generalized models that can detect things like, has an object been put into the frame? Has a background been changed? And what this allows us to do is to kind of circumvent some of this rat race. So when OpenAI comes out with a new edition of Dolly, our models aren't outdated. Rather, they stand the test of time and we can continue to develop them. Um, and then in terms of, uh, Mari, your question on why us, um, I think we're uniquely equipped in that we have the background in disinformation and mis- and disinformation research. So me and Arash have a, over seven combined years of research publishing reports and op-eds in this field. And I think a lot of companies and even, even the big guys look at this from a purely technical standpoint and don't take into that kind of nuance of mis- and disinformation and how it works. And that's time. Okay, thank you. And we'll give the judges a few seconds. Tia, are you ready? Um, yes. Okay, so just don't share your screen yet. Hang on one second until I uh, get the thumbs up. Marty, William, Carlton, we're all good. You can share your screen. All right, let's see. Wait, right, can you see everything? Yeah, we can see it and we can hear you fine. So everybody, please welcome Taya Ross from 
Kalos Coalition's TSSL. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ms. Thea Ross. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Kalos Coalition, a nonprofit organization dedicated to uplifting and amplifying trans excellence and joy. Today, I'm thrilled to present the Hampton Roads Trans Safe Space List, a vital initiative designed to identify and create safe spaces for the trans community and allies in Hampton Roads, an intersectional application and community initiative that aims to be a model to ensure and promote accessible public accommodations for LGBTQIA plus folks and other historically marginalized groups. So who are we? The Kalos Coalition, as I said, is a Hampton Roads nonprofit with a mission to spread trans joy by connecting LGBTQIA plus folks and allies, providing direct aid and promoting inclusive spaces. But what does Kalos mean? Kalos is the non-gendered ancient Greek word for internal and external beauty. We believe that beauty, true beauty, is not some objective physical measure so much as a state of being. When a person moves through life supported and assured of who they are and their purpose, they shine. And that light is the essence of Kalos, of beauty. Our shared communities grow stronger and shine brighter when we embrace acceptance over judgment. The status quo is difficult. Existing lists and resources lack a comprehensive scope and system of user reviews, community-informed ratings, and standards for trans and folks and families. Safe spaces aren't a luxury. They are a necessity, especially for transgender and queer individuals who often face discrimination and isolation. Only 17% of trans and gender nonconforming youth reported having access to community events and spaces. Hampton Roads has a unique opportunity to set the gold standard for inclusivity with our TSSL project, not just for trans adults, but for trans youths and families. Thus, our plan. We're going to utilize trained volunteers to solicit every business and public accommodation, zip code by zip code across Hampton Roads. We're going to develop a web and mobile app that provides comprehensive information and ratings via maps and categories, as well as a portal for users and community volunteers on how to solicit and report issues, uh, reviews, ratings, verification, accountability. These things don't come from a spreadsheet alone, and managing, updating, verifying, and following up and processing these reviews isn't free. The TSL may be centered around and grounded in the struggles faced by gender nonconforming and queer folks, but it's a project designed holistically to reach across identity boundaries to ensure safe spaces for kids, families, and all of our community. This work itself is enlightening, for better or worse, but it knits us together beyond gender identity because trans means across. We've designed the TSSL in five meticulous phases. We're currently at the exciting juncture between the planning and ex ex execution phases with our lead US designer already developing mockups based on an invaluable community feedback. I'm excited to showcase much of that work today. Our key objectives are to offer a vetted, reliable database of transgender-friendly businesses and services, thereby ensuring safety, inclusivity, and empowerment. Partnerships with esteemed organizations like the 757 Creative View Center and Volunteer Hampton Road significantly bolster our mission. We have a small but dedicated team of volunteers. They are the backbone of our efforts from building the app to, develop, to engaging with businesses. Technology-wise, we're laying the groundwork for an app that's as intuitive as it is informative. Vetting is at the heart of our TSSL project. We're committed to creating a resource you can trust by incorporating robust community feedback on what vetting should mean for business solicit. So for the trans community, this means safety, inclusivity, and empowerment. And for the broader community, this means business prosperity, community cohesion, and promoting equality. We started and accepting right. and developing our training procedure. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Do you want to share your screen? Great. And do you have something to grab the questions judges are going to ask? Absolutely. Down some notes if you need to. And we're going to start with uh, with William this time. All right, yeah. Thank you. That was a nice presentation. Uh, I would, <clears throat> my question for you is that you mentioned that it seems to be heavily dependent on volunteers to help um, build up this list. So I'm wondering how you would scale this opportunity. And then we'll go to Carlton. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, and you, you did get a chance to get to it, but I, I, I really want to understand what the ask is here. Um, you know, what it is that you're looking for, uh, because I see the, the platform and what you're trying to do and, 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 and getting the word out. What is it that you need? And finally, Marty. Yeah, I love what you're doing. I mean, any of us who are even sort of obliquely attached to this community understand the need for safe spaces. So uh, I love what you're trying to do. Um, I guess the question is, uh, why hasn't Yelp and TripAdvisor and others already done this? Excellent. Well, Tim, we you're ready to go. Tim's going to give you two, two uh, minutes on your clock when they start. And the floor is yours. 
First of all, uh, I'd like to address William's uh, uh, questions about volunteers and scales. We currently have a partnership with Volunteer Hampton Roads, which gives us access to a, a pool of volunteers. It's over 47,000 volunteers that we're able to uh, do background checks and vet, and we also have our own independent training process. We're hoping eventually to create this as a model that can be scalable beyond the seven cities here and across the peninsula and beyond. We're also talking already to um, some of our partners and trying to create another chapter of our organization in Winston-Salem in North Carolina and things like that. So there is an ambitious goal there. Um, as far as to answer Marty's question real quick about Yelp and Google reviews, it's actually a shame that Yelp and Google reviews have not actually collated a lot of this data. You'll find a lot of times there's piecemeal information, things about uh, trans or queer owned businesses, black owned businesses, disability access that's piecemeal, that's not complete. That's why we want to do this as a systemic, comprehensive program. In the same way people sell water heaters or they sell different things, we can go zip code by zip code. We can have volunteers take 10, 20 packets and go into their neighborhoods, into their communities, and solicit not just businesses, but the public accommodations. We're talking about public parks, doctor's offices, all these other sorts of things. Because when it comes down to it, when you're trans and you have a trans family, you need to know that it's safe for your kids and for yourself where you go. And if those places aren't safe and they're not willing to stand up, then, you know, we should know to avoid them as a community because honestly, that's not healthy for their business. Also, uh, when it talks about the ask, I'm really hoping to try to get funding and partnerships. Right now, we're looking to try to find people to get business memberships. We have a model that we're, we're using. I don't know if I can put my share screen back up real quick just to share that real quick. Um, but the, the idea is again that um, we do. Uh, that we have different types of memberships and things. It, we want to create a model that will be self-sustaining over time. So when we go around and solicit and talk to these individual businesses, we can say to them, hey, why don't you support through direct aids, giving us $25, $50, $100 a month? And then you'll be able to actually see yourself and your business listed in our list as saying you provide direct aid through our other pro projects and programs for a nonprofit to the, to the trans community, and as well as to the users. We have verification in, in, inside of our memberships that includes like making sure they have the right names and phone numbers. That's and things right. And that way we actually have sustainable views. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, we'll give the judges a, a few seconds here. And Crystal, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Okay, don't share your screen yet. Just waiting on everybody. So I got William, I got Carlton, got Marty, we're good. Okay, Crystal, you can share your screen. Thank you. All right, ready okay, to go. Crystal, you ready? Yes. Okay, Crystal, please welcome Crystal Lugo from BNC's Gloves. Thank you very much. And I am the inventor of the Glove Scaler. It just takes one great idea to change your life. As Lori says, it takes one great idea to change your life. Not just my life, but the life of the commission fishing industry. I was blessed to create a two-in-one product, a glove and a fish scaler to grip and scale fish by using your hands, offering a faster and safer way to descale fish versus the traditional methods. So why the glove scaler? Well, look at here. Peter here, he's tired of using gloves that is easily punctured. He's tired of sores and potential of contracting a disease called fish handler disease. By offering Peter the glove scaler, not only does this solve his major concerns while handling fish, but now Peter can quickly and efficiently scale fish by using his hands without risking and exposing his hands to industry. So why isn't our competitors doing this? Well, we're the only fishing glove on the market that's able to do two things, eliminate the need to hold the scaling tool and provide proper and adequate protection. As you can see, we have a sweet spot offering the glove scaler at a competitive advantage of $79.99. So where have we gone today? Well, year to date, we've won pitch competitions. We've been features on social media platforms as well as local news channel. Recently, we're selected. I was selected to pitch for ABC Shark Tank, soon to have an air date pending. And right now, our MVP has been circling around Hampton Roads, getting feedback from our customers, why they love it, why they don't just want pre-orders. They want the product now. Sorry, one second. So the total market opportunity, this is a $59 billion industry just with fishing um, equipment alone. 
we realize we can service one, one 28 billion people that need fishing products that are always on the rise looking for new ways to protect themselves, new gadgets to give to their family or friends. We are predominantly projecting our sales through social media campaigns, websites, trade shows. We are looking for individuals who fish recreational and who is also needing to protect their hands. So together, we can scale this business. Who's ready to scale? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Are you ready for some questions from the judges? Have something to write down with, you ready? We're gonna start with Carlton this time. Yeah, um, being the Shark Tank enthusiast I am, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this uh, to show up on, this, on the show. <laughs> um, I'm curious as to how many people have used the product to date that you're aware of? Um, what does your current inventory look like as far as available gloves and um, are there gloves like this on the market? And uh, Marty? Oh, wait, he has three questions. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so uh, Kristen, you know, I've seen this before. I uh, love what you're trying to do. Um, quick question. Uh, one question. Um, can you quantify the value of what the user will get for his $79.99? In other words, how many more fish can he do and how much you know money can he save with that 80 bucks and william yeah thanks uh, nice link carlton i'm looking forward to seeing you in shark tank too uh, <laughs> i i think my my question really is around and you may have mentioned it so apologies is around ip and what protection you have for this product yeah. um yeah that's it thanks very much Okay, so you have uh, two, two minutes to answer the questions and Tim will start the clock when you start speaking. Awesome, thank you. So let's start with William. Yes, this is fully patented and it's fully trademarked. So we have IP coverage um, around the glove scaler. And Marty, to answer your question, the quantity and the value um, about basically how does the glove scaler equate to our other competitors? Well, they are using gloves that dispose every day. Once it's punctured, they discard of it. They buy new gloves. So we're only we're not only protecting their hands, but we're reducing the cost of what they will pay over and over again per fishing trip, per fish, you name it, for family and friends. So this is a reusable glove. It cuts down the time in half as they're scaling, and it provides proper protection because the biggest thing is reduced injury. We want to stress injury as you're touching certain aquatic um, species carry bacteria. So our first prime is protecting you from disease, which is a fish handler's disease, as I pointed out. And last but not least, Mr. Carlton, you had three questions in one. So... Um, we have did beta testing with probably over 100 users in the course of this journey. Um, we've gotten feedback. We've done market tests. We have other individuals, actual fishermen who have tested this product. And our inventory we're trying to acquire right now is 3,000 units. We have pre-orders, but our customers tell us they don't want pre-orders. They want the product. So as soon as they touch it and feel the gloves, they love how it feels. They love compared to the other products and they're willing to buy it right now. Um, I've gone to fish marinas, fishing piers. People have bought the prototypes right off of my hands because they said they want the product now. And this is why I'm out here. So they bought it right off of me. <laughs> Last time. Okay, thank you. Thank Give the you. judges just a, a few seconds for a thumbs up when they're ready. Okay, um, everybody's good. So uh, judges, I think we're gonna send you off to your link and um, we uh, they, they will escape from here and then we'll we're just gonna take 10 minutes. Uh, just, uh, and then everybody come back in about 10 minutes. It's 7.27 now and uh, we'll take 10 minutes. When you come back, if the judges aren't back yet, we'll chit chat or Tim will do a puppet show or something. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. I've been waiting for that all year. Exactly. All right. We'll see you soon, everybody. Uh, so as we said in the intro tonight, we're going to find out who the uh, the final three are to round up the top 12. Uh,
pitchers of the year. So it's pretty neat what we've been able to do, uh, essentially get the top 12 pitchers within Hampton Roads uh, of the year. For that, there is going to be a, uh, a special pitch perfect on October 25th. For This is not open to the public. This is just for the 12 finalists for uh, the championship pitch. Not mandatory to attend, highly encouraged. Typically, uh, two of the three winners historically have all attended Pitch Perfect. Uh, and many of you have been on Pitch Perfect before, something that Gary and I have taught for several years now. Um, that said, there is a different rubric that will be uh, that you'll be rated against on November 8th, which is the championship pitch night. Um, to keep everything fair across the board, the people in the first three micro pitch competitions, they have not been, they they don't know what's on this rubric either. They have the opportunity to continue working on their business. So that may benefit them. But in terms of we'll share everything, uh, what's on the rubric, what to expect, uh, the details for pitch perfect, that will go out this week um, so that you all can start to, to look at that, review it, and uh, start preparing. So October 25th, Pitch Perfect. November 8th is the uh, the actual event itself. Um, in terms of, received a few questions about payment. When that happens, we wait. Uh, payment, we wait until after November 8th, just because uh, from an accounting uh, standpoint, we wait until after the event. So we know who gets 500, who gets 5,000. Uh, we will have some paperwork that needs to be filled out uh, w from the from an IRS standpoint because uh, anything over six hundred dollars is taxable. So uh, we have some paperwork that will go out um, that will go out on or around November eighth as well. Um, one thing that people have can routinely asked for, and we used to do this a lot, uh, or not necessarily, we used to do it on a regular basis. Before COVID, we would have networking events. It's something that people have continued to ask for over and over and over again. So there is a networking event hosted by Innovate Hampton Roads. It's called Venture Out. That's going to take place on November 1st at WHRO in Norfolk from 5 to 7. So the whole idea of uh, what Venture Out is to take people to places that they have never been to before and introduce them to people that they may not have had a chance to meet. So uh, November 1st, 5 to 7, WHRO, we can uh, send information on that. And I encourage you all, you are now part of the entrepreneurial community. So stay part of the community, continue to be involved. Um, really, really proud of all of you. It's interesting to see from micro pitch to micro pitch, you never know what you're going to, what you're going to get. And, and it just really, it's, it's fascinating in the sense of sometimes the talent I mean, it just varies in strength. And uh, so that's what's really bizarre to me. The other thing that's really bizarre to me is like when we review all the applications and then when we see how much progress is made from application to pitch night, kudos to you all for continuing to work on those uh, on, on your business ideas or your businesses. So uh, congratulations to you all. It looks like the judges are back, so that means that there there is some some information handy. Um, what if Thomas is around? I would like to get a quick pitcher. Uh, judges, is there anything that you would like to pass pass along to our pitchers tonight? A great presentations. Uh, it was. Uh, challenging to go through some of the uh, discussions that we had, but I tell you, this was one of the um, mm -hmm. uh, more exciting groups that I've had the opportunity to, to participate as a judge in, and you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. So great job, everyone. So even if you didn't win tonight, just know that uh, I think that you put in a lot of good work and, um, you know, the pitches and the ideas behind the pitches are very innovative. And I would encourage you to just continue on your journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what what he said. <laughs> I, I did this all over the world. I, I, this is the I don't know, fourth one I've done in two weeks. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a good group, and uh, you should all be really proud for uh, 
having been selected. And uh, if you don't win, keep at it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, I'll say what they both said as well, but just uh, also thanks to uh, some very smart, cool, worthy ideas, and thanks for sharing them. Um, yeah, and good luck in the future. Awesome. Well, thank you, judges, and uh, we'll grab a quick picture. All right, everybody, smile. I'll do one more. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I do not have information, so I uh, will be just as surprised as everyone else. I, Gary, I'm assuming that uh, you've got the deets. Is everybody still happy? We're ready? This is not in any order. It's just a, the three. Uh, so the first one on my list here is Tina Mikula from Melodyville. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next is Crystal Lugo from BNC's Gloves. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the last one, not in any order, but the final qualifier are Jeremy Swack and Arudge Veach from Fortentify. Well, congratulations, everybody. Thank well, you so much, guys. So you can look for some some email uh, information here from uh, from Star Peninsula here very soon with further instructions there. Um, for everyone else, I guess we already have applications coming in for 2024. This has been an unprecedented year in terms of how quickly everything has sold out. I mean, it is just, it's, it's stunning. The number of people that participate in Pitch Perfect, the number of people that uh, participate in Star Peninsula from the pitching standpoint. So we will open everything up for 2024. Um, probably as as soon as we as soon as we get through the the championship pitch in November. But uh, we'll we'll do it all again. We'll load everything up. We'll get the calendar set and ready to go. Chances are, is probably going to follow suit pretty close to uh, what we've done in the past. We just know it works. Uh, we don't. So we'll do two in the spring, we'll do two in the fall, and we'll take the summer break so that we don't have to compete with vacations and mm -hmm. different types of breaks. So with that said, congratulations to everyone. Stick with what you're doing. Thank you to the host localities on the peninsula for all of your support, judges. Thank you so much, Carlton, Marty, William. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. For your help with the rubric, last minute rubric uh, fixes, Gary, Andrew, you guys are great. Uh, it, it, hopefully it looks smooth on our end, but it's anything but smooth on the back end as we're trying to uh, to make all this stuff work. But uh, grateful for you all. It's uh, it's an honor to work with you guys, pitchers included. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats, everybody. Yep. Congratulations. Good night, everyone. And Thank have you. a wonderful Good job, evening. everybody. Thank you, judges. Good night. Good night. Good night.